This is episode 487 of the Locked on Texas Rangers podcast. I'll be joined today by a very special guest, Kennedy Landry, the MLB.com Texas Rangers beat writer. This is her first year on the beat, now completed. Um, great Twitter friend, great writer, great reporter. Very happy to have her on the show. I want to thank you guys for making Locked on Rangers your first listed of the day. So without further ado, here is my talk with Kennedy Landry of MLB.com. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Rangers, your daily Texas Rangers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And here we are today joined by a very special guest, Kennedy Landry of MLB.com. This is Kennedy's first season as the MLB.com Rangers reporter taking over for T.R. Sullivan, who I believe held the role since, uh, if my math is correct, 1773. She is a member of the Association for Women in Sports Media, an alum of LSU, where she wrote for the Reveille and is also uh, written for or worked for the Sports Journalism Institute. Kennedy, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you, man? I'm, I'm doing good. It is an off season. There are, um, there are some GM meetings where something is going to happen or nothing is going to happen and people are just going to hang out in uh, Southern California for, I don't know, the next few days. foreseeable few days. We didn't get the invite. It's fine. We're fine. We're chilling here and, you know, in, enjoying our our time not traveling. Uh, how has your offseason been? How has your offseason been so far? I know you did a little bit of postseason work, and so I didn't want to like ask you while you're in the middle of postseason. Just give you a few days to like just not be in the baseball. Yeah. Game. So what have you been up to since your season ended? Uh, yeah, so I helped out on ALDS coverage between the the Astros and the White Sox. So I was in Houston, and then I went to Chicago. Um, and then, then I went home for a few days, visited my parents, went to an LSU game, and then now I've just been pretty much chilling in DFW, waiting for some moves to happen. And that's where we are right now, waiting for some big free agent signings, some great trades, and all the things that Chris Young has cooking for this organization this offseason. So it's been pretty chill. Nothing, obviously, nothing's really happened yet. And the pending CBA makes things a little bit more interesting right now. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, Speaking of, of LSU, I, I, I decided oh, to wear some God. Texas Tech gear as opposed to Alabama gear. I do still have my, my oh, flag. Oh, yes, I, I see. But I have to ask, are, are we still are we still friends after this weekend? I don't know. Look, I didn't I didn't even watch the game, man. I I decided to protect my own mental health and I, I made plans so I wouldn't even have to watch it. Apparently it was closer than I thought. Apparently they actually had a chance at the end. Um but it's a rough time to be an LSU Tiger right now. I'll say that much. Yeah, you definitely made me more miserable than I thought I would be going into this game. Um, but um, yeah, a wise choice to not watch it. And uh, Alabama football is going to be, the, the Iron Bowl is just going to be miserable. I already know it. But this is a baseball oh, podcast. It's going to be great. Oh yeah, I, I am like thoroughly <laughs> dreading it. I'm going to lock myself alone in my apartment. Like nobody talk to me. Just like put my phone like far <laughs> away from me so that I can't live tweet during it. Um, just have some some nice whiskey and, you know, shut myself off from the world. But this was your first season on the Rangers beat. I'm, I didn't honestly I didn't know who you were before you took over the role. <laughs> I'm very happy that you have become uh, a Rangers beat writer. But tell us a little bit about your journey, how you got here um, to the DFW area and uh, a little bit about what you did before you signed up to be in this role. Um, so I graduated in, in 2020, so amidst the pandemic and all of that. So I have yet to cross the stage at all. I guess I'm never going to do that now. Um, so I was supposed to intern at MLB.com during the summer of 2020, but they canceled the internship clearly because they weren't going to fly 20 interns out to, to New York City to live in that pandemic ridden world. So uh, they canceled my internship. Uh, I ended up moving back with my parents for a while. And then I started working for the advocate in Baton Rouge, who I did a lot of freelance stuff for in college, um, did some football, some softball, basketball, any basically, I was just did anything the advocate needed me to do when I was in college, from preps to LSU to whatever. So I ended up working for them covering news um, and higher education and 
the pandemic, which was not fun. I do not <laughs> recommend that for anybody, um, especially if you're not a news reporter. It was a it was a lot. It was very much out of my comfort zone. Obviously, I was in I was in college to be a sports reporter, and especially during those few months when there were no sports. Like I was, I mean, I was an unemployed for a bit after graduation before you know working for the Advocate again. So I had to take what I could get at that point, point. Um, and then I. You know, I started working for MLB.com a little after that, about September of 2020. Um, I was a reporter producer doing pretty much um, little little writing here and there, but mostly production, editing, stuff like that on the sites across, you know, all teams. And then TR retired. So they just asked me if I if I wanted to take over. And I said, why not? Um, and here we are. It was a uh, it. Honestly, I never expected it, um, but it worked out, and here I am. Yeah, and we're we're happy to have you. I mean, it was, you know, not not the greatest first season, but um, definitely um, an an interesting season. Um, but I mean, there's not a bad time to be a sports reporter. What was it like just being here around the team this season? I know it was a rebuilding year, but um, were you did you grow up a Rangers fan? Did you have kind of experience with the team at all before you came in here? Um, I very much did not grow up a Rangers fan. Um, I'm from New Orleans. We obviously don't have a baseball team in New Orleans. And I am sorry for everybody that's going to listen to this when I have to break it to you guys that I grew up a Yankees fan. Um, just you could have. I was I was worried you're going to say Astros. Yankees I can handle. Okay. Astros is the Cardinals. Fan. No, I, no, I, no. I worry just because, you know, uh, I was about to say geometrically, but geographically. There geographically, we go. yeah. Geographically, it was uh, a little bit closer than the Rangers. But that, that's yeah. okay. Everybody, I mean, everybody at home is either a, a Braves fan or an Astros fan, basically. Um, and I refused to root for anybody in Atlanta. So <laughs> that was never an option. And the Astros were, I mean, bad for the most of my childhood. So I didn't have any connection to that. And I was a Derek Jeter fan. So I can't, I feel like you can't blame me for that one. So <laughs> no, definitely um, not. So yeah, so I ended up, I grew up a Yankees fan and you know, now, now I'm an unbiased reporter and I, I mean, I've kind of dispatched myself from all of my fandom in general anyway, but I did grow up a Yankees fan. I did not know much of anything about the Rangers actually before, you know, taking over this role. I had um, edited and produced some of TR's writing. So I knew like peripherally, you know, what the team was like. I knew they were going into a rebuilding year, but I think Joey Gallo was probably the only player I knew for sure was on this team uh, when I started doing my research. And I was like, okay, there's um, a lot. I knew I knew Isaiah kind of fluff had won a gold gloves uh, at third base last in 2020. So it was it was a lot of researching and reading of many, many things during those first few months heading into spring training, uh, because <laughs> I can confirm I did not know in entirely too much about the Rangers. Well, you have made yourself an absolute expert on the subject, and uh, we'll have even more with Kenny Landy right after this word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Built Bar. You know, I love Thanksgiving. All the good food, good treats, and plenty of them. But maybe you want a yummy dessert that isn't so full of calories and sugar. I know I do. And it, that means that it's the perfect time for Built Bars. Built Bar is the new holiday dessert. It's new, improved, it's fantastic. You can feast on something that's absolutely delicious, and you can feel good about it, you know? You could have pie, but, you know, why would you want pie when you can have a Built Bar instead? One slice of pie has upwards of 300 calories. That's on the low end. Most Built Bars have only 130 calories, only 4 grams of sugar, with plenty of protein. How much protein does pie have? Not much. Replace that coconut cream pie with the coconut Built Bar, or you can go for a raspberry Built Bar instead of a raspberry pie. There's lots of good flavors to replace any single pie. They're low-calorie, low-carb, low-fat high in protein covered in 100% chocolate, which you can't say about all pie, about, about all pies. Look, I'm not here to hate on pies. I mean, I am a little bit, but I'm more here to talk about how great Built Bar is. Built is the great option when you're hungry if Thanksgiving isn't coming soon enough. You can go for a Built or two. I know my family always takes forever to actually get Thanksgiving ready. They say, you know, come over. We'll eat at noon. You come over at noon. It's one. It's 1.30. It's two o'clock. Oh my gosh. Why have we not eaten yet? If you said we were going to eat at noon, why are we not eating at noon? So just pop a built bar and you're a little bit less cranky and nicer to your family, which, you know, is something that we all need around the holidays. There's new surprises each month at built.com limited time flavors arriving regularly. So check the site often. There is nothing like a built bar black Friday. So mark your calendar. Black Friday will be a huge event with all sorts of surprises. I mean, 
maybe there's some other surprises, but mostly Built Bar related. Those are the best ones. I wouldn't steer you wrong. Trust me. Go to Built.com. Use promo code LOCKED15 and you'll get 15% off your order. Use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. And now back to my talk with Kennedy Landry of MLB.com. And we are back with Kennedy Landry of MLB.com talking about her experience moving to Texas from Louisiana, knowing all about that and, um, you know, not knowing a whole lot about the Rangers, but, you know, it doesn't take too long for you to sink your teeth in and become an absolute expert on this team. And you talked about Joey Gallo being one of the guys who you knew about beforehand. And, you know, if you had listened to this podcast, you would have heard it would like you would have thought, OK, I guess Joey Gallo is the only player on this team because of my absolute obsession with him <laughs> and now deep depression with him being gone. Um, question about, uh, you know, the front office. Do they know how much they hurt me personally by trading Joey Gallo? Did they factor that into account um, when they were trading him? Um, and if not, um, why not? <laughs> uh, I think the front office knew exactly, maybe not you personally, but they knew it was going to hurt. Um, I think I can remember exactly when we had the the press conference with John Daniels and Chris Young after the trade. And JD was like, I get this hurts. Like my kids are Rangers fans. They're very sad about it. <laughs> like, and yeah, you, you have to get that. Um, and I think the front office didn't, I don't want to say they didn't want to do it. I think they knew they had to do it. And I think we all knew they had to, to do it, but I think they knew it was going to hurt everybody. And, you know, Joey was very sad. And I think, you know, we all talked to him on the field at Yankee Stadium before the Rangers faced them back in uh, September, October, whenever that was. Um, and you can tell, you could tell Joey was very upset by the fact that it was happening. And it seems like while we all knew that he was likely getting traded, I don't think he ever let himself believe that was going to happen um, until it finally did. Yeah, uh, Joey and I were in a very similar space. Uh, deep, deep, <laughs> incredible denial. Like, no, 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 it's not going to happen. I, like, you know, you, you always know in the back of your head. I'm like, I'm semi-logical. I know, like, this is probably going <laughs> to happen. Like, I would love for them to, you know, extend him. And there is a lot of value in having a, a star around. Like, when the Braves were doing their rebuild, having Freddie Freeman around, and now mm -hmm. having him see it throughout um, – their time when they were building into contenders and now winning a world series with them. There's a lot of value in that and selling tickets, but um, a guy who was really putting butts in seats and being the kind of star of the show, the guy who was, was robbed by um, the baseball writers association of America for not even being named a finalist for rookie of the year in Adolis Garcia. Uh, I have to ask, are, were you one of the ones who was voting in that award? Um, or do you have a list of names? I just, I just want to talk to them. <laughs> Um, so I did not have a rookie of the year vote. I had a different vote in the BBWA awards. Um, and the awards are, the voters are made public after the winners are announced next week. So you'll have that list ready to go. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, that was contentious. Um, I think, I, I think Randy Rosarena is the rookie of the year, like hands down in my, from my personal opinion, I probably, if I had had a rookie of the year vote, I would have voted for Randy, but I don't see I don't see any way why, where Adolis isn't a, a finalist, you know, watching this guy all year, he was an all-star and obviously he went through a lot of growing pains, adjusting to major league hitting and, and adjusting to the pitchers who were adjusting to him and all the things that it takes to be a hitter on the major league level. And I know, you know, April and May were like obnoxiously good, like months, <laughs> like, and I think, I think he got faulted a bit there by, by those growing pains, by the fact that he had to go through the pitchers adjusting to him. And, you know, his strikeout rate was very high. His walk rate was very low until the end of the season where he started to be more selective with his, with the hitting. But I, I think he was very much faulted by having to play a full year and not, you know, he, 70 he games. To, not seven yeah, games. Um, yeah, I think that was one of the things that, that bothered me the most. Like, I loved Wander, and it felt like a confirmation bias of him. Like, oh, look, the number one prospect. How, did he have a decent season? Yeah, how many games did he play? Don't worry about it. It was like, if if Jacob deGrom isn't a finalist for the NL Cy Young with the historic season he had despite the injuries, I know it's different reasons. Like, it's, you know, um, right. keeping him in the minors, whatever the proper lingo is for Wander Franco. The, the um, versus time. Injury. Yeah, yeah, um, versus um, injuries. But I feel like if Jacob deGrom is not a finalist, which, like, I I might still put, like vote him, like, number two if I had um, a vote just because of how ridiculously good his season was. And I don't think that 
Wander Franco should be rewarded for playing only 70 games. No disrespect right. to him. But also, no, I mean, I, he's, he's a phenomenal player. And I think, I mean, he did prove that through his 70 games and he was the number one prospect for a reason. But you take Adolis's first 70 games versus Wander's first 70, 70 games and they're, they're like comparable. And, you know, Wander didn't have to go through the full growing pains that Adolis did have to. And I know you go through, like, the Rays were a contending team. They didn't bring him up because he didn't have to, blah, blah, blah. That's not of any fault of his own. That's the Rays in their own front office and whatever type of service time manipulation anybody may or may not be doing, I don't know. But, again, it's not of any fault of Wander's that he wasn't called up on, you know, April 1st. But And he probably should have been. But he still didn't play a full season like like Adoli did. So, yeah, and I think the thing that bothers me more about it is that like Wander Franco is a great player. Randy Rose Reina, um, Luis Luis Garcia only had like a fine season. I don't I don't think that a team's win loss record should affect like how they get votes, and I think it kind of did. But with Adolis, not that he's not going to go on to have a pretty decent major league career, but like Wander's going to go on. He he might win an MVP. He's going to be you know a probably 10 time all-star he's going to have a great career like Randy Rose Rain is probably going to have a little bit longer of a career but Adolis he's 28 years old it's also partly the story and false partly like he made this team like must watch tv a team that was losing this many games with his defense which is something you really don't see all that often right and I think I think I don't know how people vote I don't want to you know say that but I don't <laughs> think people took into consideration how much his defense mattered to this team. Um, obviously, they lost 102 games. It, I mean, one person can't affect the game that much. But he really did change a lot of games purely by his defense, and you see that almost every day. Yeah, it was definitely fun to watch. I will never get over that play that he made when he was in right field. A ball that I feel like he made a jump on before the, the player even mm. started swinging. That He just, like, robbed it over that um, – first base like dugout line it was just absolutely an otherworldly play but he was just doing stuff like that all season the like i don't know if he has to get his arm registered as like some kind of <laughs> nuclear weapon because like i haven't seen anybody like maybe not even joey gallo uncork throws like he did like flat-footed 95 miles an hour like on a strike it was just so much fun to watch and you know kyle gibson is another guy who who came out of nowhere this year. He had a pretty decent second half to last season, which is, you know, a 30 game stretch, which is, you know, not a whole lot, but the first half of the season, he was absolutely on fire. What was it like to be around Kyle Gibson? What kind of impact did he have on this team in the time that he was here? Kyle Gibson was honestly one of my favorite players to talk to on this team. And I think we, as the writers have talked about this a lot, but he's like genuinely such an intelligent guy. He has such good like baseball IQ and he'll, He'll sit there and talk to you about pitching for 20, 30 minutes if you asked him to. And he's always and he's always willing to talk. He's just he was always willing to come out and you know talk to the writers, do whatever they needed to do. And obviously he was clearly the only basically veteran presence on the pitching staff, in, in addition to Jordan Lyles, who really did step up after the trade deadline. But you know, Kyle was amazing, and I think you can see that on the field when he really had that turnaround, especially when you realize from, from last year, even from Minnesota to Texas, he completely turned everything around and every, how he pitched. I didn't really follow a lot of how he did after the trade deadline, honestly. Um, Wasn't as because, great, but you know, I blame the Phillies for that one, not Kyle. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't, I, I'm so like detached from the national league sometimes that like, like towards the end of the season, when I realized the, the Cardinals were actually like in striking distance of a playoff spot. I was like, I clear, I did not even know that. Like I was just so focused on like every, like all the American league teams that I just totally missed that. Um, but no, no, Kyle's amazing. He was one of the first players I really talked to after we started getting allowed on the field. Obviously we weren't allowed to, I didn't meet any players or coaches or anybody in person until like late May, early June, like <laughs> just because of obviously COVID and, how the protocols were working out and shaping out during the first part of this season that it took a while for for really me to meet all of these players and kyle was one of the first ones i did talk to that is something we absolutely love to hear and uh wish kyle nothing but the best in philly next season but we're gonna take a quick break when we come back we talk a little bit about what we want the rangers to do this offseason what we think they might do and um what the heck might happen 
at these GM meetings going on this afternoon. Coming up, we have this word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by betonline.ag. We're back in better than ever. A new web interface for the start of basketball season and more props, odds, and lines than ever before. BetOnline remains your number one spot for all the basketball and football action this season. Head to our new updated desktop or mobile site, sign up today. Receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code Locked On to receive your bonus. From basketball, football, NHL, boxing, UFC, write your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait, don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. And you want to bet on the Stars going to overtime and maybe winning a game this year in overtime, which they have done a lot. It's kind of confusing. You could bet on that. If you want to bet that uh, Luka Doncic is going to go for 30 points, I feel like that's a pretty safe bet. If you want to bet on Dak Prescott um, doing some Dak Prescott things, I don't know what specific Dak Prescott things you could bet on, but like, go check it out. Go to Bet Online. It's the best, the fastest, and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. Bet Online, where the game starts. And now back to my talk with Kennedy Landry of MLB.com. And we are back with Kennedy Landry of MLB.com talking Rangers baseball, talking Kyle Gibson, talking, I don't know, random whatever happens to come into our past. And so today is the uh, GM meetings, which I, maybe they're just hanging out and getting coffee. But I feel like with the impending CBA, like maybe it's just like a, hey, like this can be like a chill kind of gm meeting that we haven't had before i'm just like catch up like how's your family you know what do you want for christmas where are you going for thanksgiving things like that do you think that might be more of the conversations happening in Ugh. in this one i'm sure there'll be some business talk god i wish <laughs> <laughs> um i i don't know I, like genuinely i'm not sure how these gm meetings will play out considering the impending cba and how we don't know if winter meetings will will happen. You know when and if we get to we get to Orlando on December seventh. Um, so I don't know how that affects how these winter GM not winter meetings will work, <laughs> and if anybody is actually going to be you know dealing or whatever. Um, it's going to be very interesting. Um, I'm looking forward to the dispatch from all of our reporters who are down there because. I genuinely don't know. I mean, hopefully we get an interesting couple of weeks before we get up to the deadline because who knows what will happen come December. Uh, but but it'll be fun, I think. Well, it's, I'm hoping they do at least a little bit of something. I've got five shows a week for the majority for the entire month of November. And then it goes it, it goes down to three a week in December. So I need something to talk about. So I don't know, maybe <laughs> they could like send me some some transcripts or something like that. But um what are you expecting the Rangers to do this offseason? They've been talking a little bit about, I, I mean, reports have been coming out that they might try and bring Clayton Kershaw home. Um, my boy um, very would love to have him here. There's also um, talk that they were at um, a throwing showcase, I think was the term for, for Verlander, Justin yes. Verlander. Um, what kind of benefit do you think it would bring on a team who will probably be just like starting to come out of the rebuild next year, not quite contending to have these veteran guys on this staff, um, especially with guys like Dane Dunning and uh, Taylor Hearn and maybe Cole Wynn at some point next season. What do you, what kind of benefits do you think those guys could bring uh, on this pitching rotation? I think, I think the Rangers very much need a good solid veteran starter. Um, no offense to Jordan Lyles, who again was a very, uh, became a big like leadership presence in the pitching staff after the trade deadline. But I think they need a really solid established veteran who can really guide this young pitching staff into next season. And as you said, out of the rebuild, um, I don't know if that's going to be Kershaw or Verlander or somebody, you know, just more middle tier, maybe like Marcus Stroman or um, like anybody who really is, there's a lot of free agent pitchers up for grabs and the Rangers are definitely going to need a lot of people to, to throw some innings because all of these guys are very young. So I, I think it's, they need one, probably more than one pitcher to sign or trade or whatever. Um, Clayton Kershaw, I think is going to be very interesting because he is from the DFW area and that is well-documented. Um, I've always said, I think the guy's a Dodger for life. Um, I think the, you have to, you have to try. There, there's no way the Rangers don't try to get him home and bring him home. I know he has a, he has a house here. Like, 
it's oh, not yeah, like he, he has to move. He, like, lives, he lives here during the off season. Like right. every off season, he you know his he grew up here. His wife grew up here. Um, her family, I think, also grew up here, and they her parents uh, live in the area. I think his parents still do as well. But like, there is some some seriously strong ties, and it would be really tough to go from being a Dodger his entire career, being contending his entire career to. I mean, the Rangers probably aren't going to be contending this year. I mean, if they sign him to like a three, four, five year deal, I think they might be by the end of it. But going from, you know, the hundred win team to the Dodgers to Texas might be tough. Mm. But I think if anywhere can draw him away, it's Texas. I don't know that they can. But I you, think like those said, are the only try. two options. Yeah. Um, I, I don't see, again, I don't know. I don't know anybody in Kershaw's camp. I'm not going to pretend like I do, but I just don't see how he goes anywhere that's not, you know, home to Texas or, you know, stay in LA where he's been his entire career. Yeah. Another guy who's got Texas ties who I would love to see in Texas is uh Mansfield's own Noah Sindergaard, who is a, um, is it, is it called a restricted free agent? He was given the qualifying offer. I, I don't know if that's right. the technical term, but um, a guy who throws absolute gas through an inning this year, and I think didn't pitch in the 2020 that he missed because Tommy John surgery. So he's been Correct. basically out for, for two years, but um, a guy who, when he's healthy, he is absolutely dominant, a really great Twitter game and um, a lot of <laughs> beef with uh, Mr. Met. Could that drive him into the army yeah. of the Rangers? I think captain's a little better than Mr. Met. So maybe so <laughs> maybe he has a little better, better relationship with, with captain. I think the Mets, I think the Mets in general create very interesting outlooks for all of their free agents this coming season because um, they don't currently have a president of baseball operations, they don't currently have a GM, and they don't currently have a manager. So, uh, and <laughs> especially when whatever happens with the CBA, um, I would think they want at least one of those three things um, <laughs> because you think. I, you would because who is is Alderson making the deals right now? Like I who who is doing anything with the Mets? And I think that that just makes things a little more interesting when it comes to the Mets free agents. Like I said, Cindergard, uh, I think he's an interesting guy. Like you said, hasn't pitched since 2019 and could you know be a middle of the rotation guy, especially for the Rangers when doesn't take much because there's just so many young guys on the staff right now. Um, I mean, again, the Chris Young and John Danos have said, you know, they're looking to improve everywhere. And I know fans have a lot of apprehension um, whenever the front office says anything because they haven't been willing to spend big in the past. Um, I wasn't here for that. So I'll take everybody else's word. But it seems like they're very upfront about their willingness to, you know, be active and be aggressive this winter. And I think you have to go after whoever you can. Um, if that means going after Noah Syndergaard, who hasn't pitched in two years, it's, you know, low risk, high reward, might as well. Um, I, I don't know. I just think you have to, they have to try on pretty much everybody, honestly. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and, you know, uh, of the who's making decisions and doing things for the Mets, I feel like that's a perpetual question, even when they have a GM. <laughs> um, but if you don't have a GM, are you allowed to send someone to the GM meetings? Does like Steve Cohen just like show up or I am so confused. I need to oh, know. Wow. I didn't even think said. about I didn't even think about that. I wonder. I feel like Alderson's got to be talking tomorrow. Maybe they're right? like, sorry, GMs only. Um, nobody else can come. <laughs> you can't show up to these meetings. You don't have a GM. It's like a you can't sit with us kind of thing. <laughs> oh, the Mets. Oh, no. Oh, the Mets. Um, but yeah, um, I'm I'm curious because, I mean, you weren't here for all of the years of the, them not signing people. And everyone knows that they're in a rebuild. And I mean, generally, the fan base is like, okay, well, eventually you have to rebuild after being contenders from 2010 <laughs> to 2016, kind of fool yourself a little bit in 17. Um, but I feel like, may, is it wise to broadcast so vocally like, hey, we're going to spend a bunch of money this offseason, we're going to go get your hopes up really big, instead of being like, we're going to try and get some guys like maybe we'll get some guys or not like we're a rebuilding team. And then when you do get those guys, it's more of a pleasant surprise as opposed to putting a lot of pressure on themselves to go out and get somebody because they talked all this big talk. Is that, am I over overthinking that or is that 
I don't know. Is that something that, that you thought as well? Um, I, I think it's crossed my mind, but I also have come to the conclusion that I just don't think Chris Young would be so open about his intentions if he wasn't at least mildly confident in the front office's ability to assign at least one big name free agent. I think, I think this winter will be a failure if they don't sign at least one big name guy at this point. Um, just because like you said, of how much they've talked it up. Um, I don't want to say that was not wise because I think so many fans have kind of lost trust in the front office's ability to kind of make moves happen. Uh, I think they had to broadcast that. Yes, we're, we're trying, um, whether, whether they go out and, you know, sign Clayton Kershaw or, uh, Carlos Correa or whatever, they at least have, you know, shown that they are making the effort to at least do that. But, you know, you got to appreciate, I mean, you, you got to do something in, in a, a losing season. It's a franchise that had been, had done so well for so long. I mean, not pretty much nobody can be the raise of just like win 90 <laughs> games every single year for a decade. And even when you lose all of your good players or trade them away or wait half a season to call them up, like they still keep winning games. But um, I do appreciate that they are setting these expectations so we can like get our hopes up and have something to talk about. And there are a whole yeah, lot sure. of, of big free agents this off season. Um, who do you think of those three, the three big names at shortstop of those three, who do you think the Rangers are, are targeting the most? Do you think they have um, a preference or if they got any one of those three that they would be calling that a successful off season? Um, I believe, I believe Evan Grant asked this question uh, last time we were on Zoom with Chris Young and, you know, who does the best player technically equate to the best player for the Rangers, if that makes sense. Because, mm -hmm. you know, Chris Young, John Daniels, Chris Woodward have all talked a lot about, you know, the culture and they're very adamant about building the right culture. And you don't want to bring in a guy who's really good but may not be a good clubhouse guy. And I, it seems like all three of these big name shortstops are very good clubhouse guys. They all seem to be very well liked in all of their respective clubhouses at this point. Um, and I think Carlos Correa is definitely the the top free agent shortstop at this point. Um, and I think I think he's good defensively. Probably going to win the Gold Glove at shortstop this year, and is the best had the best year offensively in 2021 by far, out of him, Story, and, and Seager. So then it becomes, do you want to? you know, shoot for Correa. And I just personally don't think that's going to happen. I think it's more likely, you know, Correa ends up in Detroit with AJ Hinch or in New York with the Yankees or, you know, any number of, of other teams. I know John Heyman tweeted today that almost a dozen, a dozen teams are on the lookout for those five free agent shortstops. Um, but I think the Rangers have a better chance of getting either Story or Seager. Obviously Story, another DFW guy. Um, from out or over in Irving. Um, mm -hmm. And I know he had a kind of down offensive year this year. And I know we want to talk the core's effect and, and all these things. He's also the oldest of the three of them only by, I think two years, but I, I don't know. I'm a big fan of Trevor story. I, I met him when I was at the all-star game. He was, you know, very nice guy. He seems very open to coming home just as we kind of seen with Kershaw. Um, and I think, I think story is, is, probably the front runner but i think when you then you have to think about seager who has a very good relationship with chris woodward from when when he was the third base coach with the dodgers before he came over to to the rangers organization um and seager also kind of had a, a down year as opposed to last year where obviously 60 games and was the world series mvp and the lcs mvp blah 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 but i think that should probably play a point. The Rangers have a record these last few years of bringing in some old Dodgers people. Um, <laughs> I think the Rangers are pretty much made up of like 40% former Dodgers at this point. Um, that sounds about right. Like, uh, you know, we have Chris Woodward, obviously, DJ Peters, Charlie Culberson, also a former Dodger. You, you can, you know, what, pick a few everywhere. And they were probably <laughs> former Dodgers. Um, so I think that it's definitely going to, to play a role in how the Rangers are pursuing these, the shortstops this off season. Again, my, my, I'm not a GM. My personal preference would, would just to be Trevor story, but you know, we'll see. I, w 
I wouldn't mind a Trevor story. It makes me feel better that you're saying you don't think that Carlos Correa would be um, <laughs> likely to come here. Not anything against Carlos Correa, but a little bit of against Carlos Correa because he does have a little bit of that Astro stink. And just like anybody who has done well for the Astros, like coming to the Rangers and like being a part of that, I know it would definitely cause some apprehension with the fan base. There's a lot of people that I've talked to are like, I don't want Correa with like everything that he's been a part of with this, the, you know, what's coming off of, of still years later, still a lot of bad feelings about what happened in Houston with that um, cheating scandal. And they don't feel like he was apologetic enough or whatever. They just don't want that yeah. on the team. And you don't get that with Corey Seager. You don't get that with <laughs> um, Trevor story. And, um, and I think, I don't know how, how good of friends uh, Clayton and Trevor Story are, but like maybe one of those could recruit the other. If if the Rangers got both Clayton Kershaw and Trevor Story, I don't think I could be happier this December. Because <laughs> I would I don't even know what I would do if that happened, honestly. I, I would kind of I would be shocked, first of all. Like because like yes, they've talked a big game, but if they somehow did, you know, manage to lure Kershaw away from the Dodgers and get story that would be that would be insane Chris would Chris Young should go straight to the Hall of Fame for that alone <laughs> yeah absolutely I mean you talked about him having a lot of confidence I know tall people have a lot of confidence and so like maybe like the taller you are the more confident you are he's what six I mean it's so tall he's six ten seven I, I believe he's the second tallest MLB player ever if I my research was I, correct. I think you're right I forgot who it was that was taller than him I think it was someone who was six eleven um, like him and Randy Johnson were both six ten. Right. I can't Which think. Of just who sounds fake, it. honestly. Like you know, I'm, I'm five two for like for perspective's sake. <laughs> um, and most times when I talk to Chris Young, he is standing in the dugout, so he's a few, <laughs> few steps below, and he still ends up taller than me. So <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the things that I. Like of the many things that I love, the one suit that I was actually there and covering games at the NBA every single time. I'm five nine, so everybody, I'm like, hey, uh, can you tell me about this thing? Let me like raise up my mic, like literally all the right. way up. But um, I think I would love to be in an MLB, you know, clubhouse because there's less of this action going on, um, and you know, also for some reason, every basketball media person is at least like six foot, six two, like all of them. I'm like, how? Is this why I'm I'm not here anymore? Is because I'm too short? I mean, too that might short. be. I don't know. Mark Stein of uh, well, I guess formerly of the New York Times is like I think five six. So you know, okay. you got to be really special to to stick it out. But um, this any, is why I liked covering gymnastics in college. Oh my they gosh, really right? Who was shorter than me? <laughs> um, so that was perfect. That and like I feel like soccer would be great because you know you have like the Messies that's like five six or whatever. I mean, you also have like the occasional like. I think Virgil Van Dyke is like six four. Um, you have those defenders and goalies that are like super tall. But for the yeah. most part, those little forwards are just like itty bitty. Um, and that's the same thing with um, with most baseball players. Obviously, you have the Joey Gallows and the Aaron Judges, but you also have the Jose Altuve's. Um, yeah. But I'm curious. Altuve's what we, short. Oh, absolutely. Like I think him being listed as however tall he is, like they definitely. I think added, it's fake. 1, I think they definitely added a few inches. I know they did with um, with Ronald Guzman. He's listed at like six seven. That guy's at least six nine. Like there is no way he's not um, taller. I don't than know that. if he's six nine. I don't know. I I felt pretty confident that he was like taller than six seven. Um, and had a, a wingspan of approximately like thirty feet, <laughs> um, something like that. Um, Sounds accurate. But I'm I'm curious uh, to to kind of wrap this up. What were your kind of just lasting imp impressions from your first season, just being around? Texas, the team, um, just any like things that kind of shocked you or stood out in a, in a good way from your first season on the beat? Um, well, it was a long 102 loss season. I'll say that much. Um, uh, going to LSU, I've never covered a losing team before. Uh, so this was my first time ever covering a team below 500. And uh, they were quite a bit below 500. But um, I, I really enjoyed my first year here. DFW is really great. Um, it's no New Orleans, but it's a great place to live. Um, and the players and the the teams, the coaches, everybody was very nice and welcoming. Everybody on the beats very nice. Obviously, Evan, Levi, and Jeff, they're all they were all very welcoming to to me coming in as a little, you know, twenty two year old to to cover this team when they've been doing it longer than I've been alive. Um, 
So I, I really enjoyed it. The and the coaches and players are so receptive and so open to to talking for the most part. You know, I rarely had a I don't think I ever had a bad react interaction with anybody on the Rangers, you know, team or staff, which is you never know what you're gonna get with professional, you know, athletes. And the Rangers did leave a, you know, really great impression. I think Chris Woodward does know what he's doing and he's really working to to build a winning culture in this team and i think you know i hope it works out and i hope i get to cover chris woodward for a, for a long time here yeah uh chris woodward as i said has very much ted lasso vibes i know you are yes. a fellow appreciator of ted lasso and once evan brought that up in a tweet i was like you know what? i can't not see it and i even started reading uh, chris woodward quotes in my um my very mediocre ted lasso impression so uh, <laughs> but yeah it's it's definitely uh an interesting time to to be on the beat to be in the trenches and if you ever want to interview uh some coach or something that doesn't go your way just go talk to rick carlisle he's always in a perpetually bad mood so oh, okay. um, if you want to have that experience just go cover a pacers game i guess um i don't know why mlb.com <laughs> would send you that but like i don't know maybe maybe they'll try a reason um <laughs> but uh where can the fine folks listening to and watching locked on rangers find you and your work i know we have your um twitter um there we go. I'm bad at pointing with this, um, but there down there below your name. Um, but where can they find all your work? Uh, MLB.com slash Rangers or Rangers.com. That's where you see all of my work. Um, obviously at Twitter at Ken Landry with two N's. Very relevant information there. Um, and that's about it. You can, you know, like my tweets. They're usually very bad unless they're informative. <laughs> so take that with a grain of salt, but you got it yeah all tweets are bad uh some of them are just less bad than the others but that's why we love them and um thank you so much for taking the time to join us on the show and that'll do it for this edition of locked on rangers thank you for missing, making locked on rangers your first listen of the day and until next time don't forget to enjoy baseball <laughs>